So we had the Open Mandriva Summit here in Budapest. Hey, with Barrow, what's up? Hey! And uh, this is Laska and Guido, right? Right! They're listening to your song going on right here. So hello, so who are you? Oh, well, I'm Colin Close and uh, I'm the president of Open Mandriva. Um, we're here to have a short conference about where we're going next in our uh, distribution. Cool, here in Budapest. And hello, so who are you? Hello, <laughs> I'm Christina. I'm making the graphic uh, for the distribution. So right here, you, just an example of some graphic that's going on. This is uh, the login screen. The that's screen. right, yes. And, and this is the, these beautiful know. flowers and what have been Ragyada produces. That's Ragyada's Christi, Christina's handle. And who are you? Hey, I'm her son. <laughs> okay. And the driver? No, no. not the driver. You're no. taking an airplane. You're He's the here. tourist guide. Tourist. Yeah. You're going to, to, to Italy or no? You're leaving, right? Very soon. Yes, sir. Yeah. We, we are leaving. Cool. So how many people came to the summit, to the meeting here? I think yesterday we had eight people. So people came from around Europe? Yes. And uh, what did you discuss? We discussed our, the, our next release. Um, that's going to be probably in about eight months' time. And it, it's quite a big change for us because we're going to be moving to a rolling release model, um, which means we have to make quite a few changes in our building and quality assurance programmes. And that we've been discussing this at some length. So and that's uh, uh, the new plan, you might say. Uh, let's talk more about that just in a second, but uh, if you could come here, maybe show this, this part. Uh, what's going on here? Uh, we're looking at something special right here. Oh, this, this is a, a project that we're, we're moving into, or trying to anyway. This is a 64-bit ARM laptop that we have uh, we've created. I'll just power it up for you. It's a prototype, right? This is a prototype, yeah. Can we uh, open it and up? You can and probably see? see inside that... Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, bodging going on. Um, this is based on a, 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 a laptop kit, in fact. Um, this is the P which, Pi Top kit? It is a Pi Top kit, and it uses a Snapdragon, Qualcomm Strap, Snapdragon processor. Is it the Dragon Board 410C? Uh, it is indeed, yes. That's the 820X. Uh, oh, it's the 820 one, one. Ah, sorry. You put, you put 820 me. already. Okay. This is 820. As you can see, it, or well, you will see in a minute, it's running Android. Um, we are waiting, and we're right on the verge now of being able to um, have a working Adreno driver, which will allow us to run Open Mandriva on this, on this machine. And this is the first step to uh, us creating our own laptop. Um, this one has been created from various uh, modifications, as you can see, that's yeah. had an extra bit yeah. added on. Yeah, so you can just look around. And you can see it's got a new bottom. Um, and now the bottom in here lives the battery, which makes room for the, for the card in here. So... Uh, nice. So, so um, uh, how significant is this? Vera, maybe you can come up, um, come up here and uh, introduce. What, what have we been able to do with this in uh, this summit? Yeah, so... Probably, uh, given you are running armdevices.net, uh, people will be familiar with the ARM64 processors. They are really good processors that can almost match the speed of Intel processors at uh, nowhere near the power consumption. They are really interesting for developers right now uh, because a lot of us will want to target ARM64 uh, hardware. And we don't always want to cross-compile stuff. But at the moment, nobody is building desktops uh, or laptops that have an ARC64 processor in them, and it's high time that, uh, that got fixed. So the PyTop guys who built this original laptop build kit did a lot of the right things, but they went with the Raspberry Pi, which is a really nice board, but it's not fast enough to do compiling on. It's a quad-core so, A53, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's like a Dragon Ball Forte C, basically. Yeah, and actually a bit slower because they uh, use a slightly different variant. They use relatively slow memory. Like I said, it's a great board for uh, for doing embedded work, but it's not that great to compile stuff on. So we got in this faster board. Uh, this is one of the fastest 64-bit uh, uh, 
ARM boards available at the moment. And and the the PyTap allows you to uh, to to put any board you want in there. How do you do to hack it up to make it work? Now probably Colin can tell you more about that one. <laughs> well, this was a a bit of an adventure because the as you can see the the PyTap uh, case is not very deep, and the. Uh, the Snapdragon board is very long, it comes down to here. In fact, I'll show you inside and see, you can see how we have managed to shoehorn it all in to the box. As you can see, there isn't very much room. The battery had to go in this piece at the bottom, so we had to make a hole right the way through the bottom of the case so there is no bottom to this case, only this piece here, and the battery sits in this area here. This is battery right here. Mm. All the connectors that were here on this board all had to be removed, and connectors that were underneath as well had to be removed in order to fit it in the space. But fortunately, there was just enough room, as you can see, just a few millimeters, literally, spare space here to get it in. What is this board? This is uh, um, from Intrinsic. This is an Intrinsic. On the uh, 820, they have a system like this where you can uh, you can just uh, plug it in as a little uh, SOM, or what do you call it? A little. It's SOM, yeah. Yeah. yeah this is, an, this is a, a, an Intrinsic carrier board, um, which, which they they created for the 820. Is SM. it fully? Is it full? Of, the batteries are full right now. They, the is batteries. It to run it right yeah, now? yeah, it is yeah. running. Full, yeah. All right. Yeah, um, we have a mouse and uh, all sorts. You can also connect a USB? Yes, it has USB. We, we, we can connect a debugging port, which that's what we've been doing today. Um, it has internet connection, it has GPS. Um, theoretically, you could even put a, a, GPS, uh, a, 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 a mobile phone SIM card in it and <laughs> make it. Cool. Well, and uh, well, what's the RAM? It's 2 or 4 GB? It's 3 GB at the moment, but we hope in the future there will be a version that has a bit more. What do you need? 8 GB to do your stuff? How much do you want? Nah, more is better, obviously. 8 would be great, 16 would be better, 32 would be even better, but 3 is workable. Did you show this to Intrinsic? Not yet. I mean, there's a couple of things we want to sort out. Primarily, we want to get Open Mandriva on it. And we want to make it a little more reproducible. Obviously, it is hard to build more of those uh, the way they are right now. Is this 13.3 mm -hmm. inch? Yes. Yeah, 13.3. So uh, uh, there's free Drino available for uh, uh, the Snapdragon, right? So uh, are you mm -hmm. potentially uh, you could use that to make Open Mandriva work? We will certainly go with free Drino on this one, but the problem is free Drino currently doesn't work on this particular revision of the uh, chipset. But that's only a question of time. I know that Rob Clark is already working on it, so that shouldn't take Linares much longer. Connect, and he said that he was showing off 820. He was, he was able to yes. run his free Duino stuff on the 820. Yes, so there's still a couple of glitches, but uh, it's beginning to work, and we'll soon have something really good running on here. It's a matter of days, no? matter of days? Maybe. Possibly, yes. Possibly. When, when Barrow gets <laughs> back to Switzerland, yeah, yeah, he, he's going <laughs> to fix it up. How good is Barrow? He's brilliant. Oh, he is just so clever. I mean, the, the, to give you an idea, he has eyesight like uh, Batman. You know, <laughs> if you come here, right, and you you look here at his at his, don't, terminal, don't his, don't at, his email. at his terminal screen, you can see I can't even make out the individual letters. Is that a 4K display? <laughs> yes. So you got a 4K laptop right here to compile really fast to it. Yes. This is the first laptop I'm really happy with. Yeah, on most other laptops I've had, the CPUs would always go into um, 800 megahertz or so from constant overheating. This is meant as a gaming laptop, so it has a couple of things like advanced GPUs that I don't actually need, but it's big enough to allow some air circulation and yeah, it's got let some, the CPU go in. It's got some big vents right here, so you can get your compilation and uh, Clang, uh, uh, VM, all these GCC stuff you're doing, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, well, uh, we're not actually using GCC anymore. No, we, we've, we've now moved entirely to Clang. And during our meeting today and yesterday, we decided that we would move towards LLD, which is the, uh, the Clang linker, so we will now be fully using Clang all the way through our distribution. The, f 
the switch was flipped today, shall we say. Why, why did you decide this? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, it does open up um, the use of our software to more commercial um, application, um, and that's one of the main reasons. But the Clang compiler is much faster. Um, it takes less space. It generates better binaries, um, which means we can build things quicker. Generally speaking, it's a, a big improvement. I'm sure Barry could give you more technical detail than I could. <laughs> what can you say? Now, one of the big reasons that Colin hasn't mentioned yet is the code of the compiler itself. So GCC is a great compiler and does great optimizations, but its code base is almost 30 years old and that shows when you want to do something new, implement a backend for a new architecture or so, it gets a little complicated because you have to deal with a lot of craft and LLVM and Clang are based on a much newer code base. Uh, they are much nicer to read uh, C++ code and this sort of thing just enables uh, new features like support for ARC64, support for newer revisions of a chip or so to go in much faster. And that's the main reason why I think even though right now the, uh, GCC and Clang generate both pr uh, pretty much equivalently uh, good code, in the future probably LLVM and Clang will be much better and it's obviously good to get a head start on the other distributions with moving towards it. We are, I think, the only, uh, the first and only distribution using Clang to compile their distribution at the moment. So. You know, we are quite unique in that sense. Um, and is that, does that put you in an advantageous place? Well, we feel it does because, it, you know, when chips change, especially when this ARM revolution takes off, as we feel it will, because low power is going to become the real, um, the real need. You know, data centers and so on and so forth are, are getting overloaded now. They, they've reached the thermal limits of their buildings, so ARM servers are going to start coming along and, and so on. So anything ARM-based has an edge um, when it's using Clang, because as Sparrow explained, it can respond quicker to new chips, to, to changes in the architecture. And, you know, ARM is far more flexible. It's not just... Uh, limited to one manufacturer, you've got the core of the, uh, the processor, if you like, and then the, the architectural aspect is down to the individual fabs to find, you know, do different things with. So this requires a lot more flexibility from your compiler and from your build tools and, and the like. And at Linaro, the Linaro Connect that just happened uh, around the corner here in Budapest, Oh, can you hold this one thing? Um, the, this is a big deal. Uh, the getting all this ARM support smoothed out and optimized and accelerated and everything. How soon and how much is going to cost to get this Open Mandriva Snapdragon 820 laptop mass produced? <laughs> That's a good question. So, the first problem we have to sort out is the carrier board. We'd like to replace it with a smaller board that actually has equivalent functionality. You want to optimize a little bit the, the whole thing, no? the size and everything. This is uh, yeah. built on purpose to swap kind of like the board? Right. Yeah. N uh, next step will be actually building a case to, uh, for which we don't have to uh, do uh, this amount of manual uh, work to get... Uh, get the new board in. We also want a better display. This is uh, right, it's good enough for a Pi because uh, that can, uh, actually doesn't have the processing power to handle high resolution display. But uh, given we have a nice board with a decent GPU, we want uh, at least an HD panel in there. Do you want a 4K? Mm. <laughs> well, this no, is one of the big, a bit too much. One of the big yeah. problems with the, the development of this is getting the correct display. Because the uh, these processors are um, ded typically dedicated towards mobile phones. They use the MIPI standards for the graphics uh, connections. And um, unfortunately, uh, display panels currently are not manufactured very much bigger than, um, um, than tablet no. sizes. Um, so it's, it's very hard to find something to interface with the card. Did you have to do something to make that one work? One, this currently, this one's using the HDMI, HDMI. port, so yeah. that issue yeah. doesn't come in. But when we want to go bigger, 
somewhere down there. Yeah, right this down. here, look. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and the Pi, the Pi top board has an HDMI to, um, to EDP in this case, conversion process. So, so we, this is one of the sticking points at the moment in order to try and get a bigger display without having to carry all the extra current consumption that conversion involves. So we need a large display that uses the MIPI I'm just uh, trusting, sir. Just to check if there's a, uh, the, the brightness setting or something. Yeah, yeah. But I guess, uh, so uh, let's say Open Mandriva arrives on this. So let's talk about Open Mandriva, the, the advantages. Maybe can, can you grab that yeah, laptop yeah, there? Sure, yeah. uh, are well, you able to log in and show some stuff? Yeah, here we go. Um, currently, so, we are running KDE Plasma here. Okay. Um, can, can you carry this up and yeah, hold it up over yeah. here? Yeah. So what is, what is that that you're showing here? This is this is KDE five pla the plasma plasma desktop, um, fully optimized, and we I currently use this wonderful full screen um, launcher, which I find a, a really really useful device. We provide all a, a wide range of software here. Um, I don't know whether the easiest things we provide the whole office suite, for example. Um, numerous tools <laughs> for uh, sorting out various issues a good development um, process we have our own build farm which we offer um, people use of um, which build we, farm yes yeah it's called abf and this is um this is a distributed server um, build farm where users can join and provide uh, provide build nodes to the build farm it's quite a community-based um, process. Um, let's uh, typical what? application, maybe K mail here, which I probably won't start because I haven't set it up on this box. But there we are. This is a very old machine, so it's not exactly the fastest thing on earth. But uh, so, uh, do you think this Open Mandriva is the best Linux distribution? I do. Why? Why do you think that? In many ways, most of the distributions are um, similar, and I definitely think there's other good distributions out there. I'd use any of the distributions over Windows or Mac OS, but Open Mandriva does a couple of things that nobody else does, like uh, we are the first to switch to Clang as the compiler. Um, we always have the most current kernels available. Uh, like right now, we have 4.10.2 and 4.11 RC1 in our repositories. We always have the latest glibc. Uh, we always try to optimize everything to take the last uh, possible bit of performance and power savings out of the computers. And I think one important thing is that even though that might change at uh, some point in the future, we are a small enough community to still be able to make quick decisions like that switch over to LLD. Took us a couple of uh, minutes to discuss about and then a couple of minutes to the flip the switch. While in most of the bigger distributions, uh, that would take discussions for taking at least a year. And it was it decided right here in this room? It was yes. decided in this room, yeah. Yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday. Yesterday over, afternoon. Uh, over some biscuits and over, a Over tea. many biscuits and lots of tea. And <laughs> some <laughs> dog food. And some dog food. Yeah. But these guys. Guido is always ready to be on video, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Can't you tell? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, what else is, uh, is the, makes it the best? What, can you talk about, can you show some stuff? What's going on over here? Yeah, so one of the really good things is that uh, the user interface is so simple that I can give uh, Open Mandriva installation to my parents also who are not overly technical without having to worry about them not being able to use it. Did you do that already? Yes, of course. That's what they use. Hmm. And they have no viruses, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> no CIA spyware. <laughs> but you might have installed a keylogger, but that's just to, to make sure that they are okay, right? <laughs> yeah. No, no, we just use Secure Shell, you know, and yeah. lo lo log in remotely and help them out yeah. that way. <laughs> so it's easy to use. Uh, it's uh, uh, using the latest stuff. How, can, how come is it using the latest stuff? We are just really active in uh, looking at when new stuff is coming out and uh, testing it. And, uh, 
making sure that uh, once it works, it gets to our users quickly. So we have two repositories at the moment. Uh, one is Cooker, which is where all the experimental stuff goes, where you will sometimes get an update that breaks things, but that is expected because that's a developer tree. So sometimes we have to break things in order to fix them in the longer run. And the other is our 3.x repository, which is stable, where only tested stuff goes. And that's what regular people would be using. So what's the history of uh, Open Mandriva? Where does it come from? Oh, uh, gosh. That's a long, <laughs> long story. Is it? Yeah, it goes well, back yeah. to 1998 or so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was founded founded by a guy called Gael, Gael Duval in France. Um, and it was a fork of, uh, of Red Hat, um, I'm sure. It, oh. it, it became it became known as Mandrake, Mandrake Linux. And then... Um, after a while, it was uh, it was quoted on the Paris Stock Exchange, and they actually issued shares, and and some users bought shares in in the company, and it was listed on the bourse, um, and it went well for some years, and then uh, you know as as things go, sometimes there is consolidation in the open software um, realm, and Mandriva was, I think, suffered a lot from uh, from Microsoft. Uh, they lost several large contracts. In Africa, for example, which set them back. Did Microsoft uh, uh, like attack their markets or something? Yes, I think that would be fair to say that that was the case. Um, did they undercut? The, did they? They undercut them, rebates, yeah. Yeah, like they illegal under, they rebates, under, like yeah, sometimes yeah. big companies do. They were undercut, like... and uh, they had a they had a, con a very large contract in Africa in the education system, and they were um, effectively. Undermined, shall we say? They had the not contract by Intel. in their hands. Not Intel, but no, by, Microsoft. by Microsoft. This is the same thing Intel did to the one laptop per child. They just mm. went around to all the countries and and try to uh, basically gave away a few hundred thousand laptops, yep. so they would sign with Intel and not take an all PC. Yeah. But okay, so that happened. Yeah, that and, happened. Uh, and and who, course, who's the, who are the people that started it and stuff? Um, well, Gao Duval was one of the great founders, uh, and then then there were several directors after that who. And, and Gail Duval stayed on the team for quite some time until um, eventually he was moved on. There was a, a split in the management. The, the exact details, I don't know. But um, You were not there? I wasn't there. You no, didn't was, instigate the split? I didn't, <laughs> certainly didn't instigate the Did split. You? No. <laughs> None of us had uh, much to do with the company. I was actually working there between 1998 and 2000 or so. But uh, there was also some disagreement with management, which is why I left the company. And then later on, uh, let's jump directly 10 years into the future when the company was going out of business. The distribution was returned to the community. And then we came together and said, OK, we are going to maintain it and we are going to uh, bring it back to uh, the great distribution that it once was. And uh, how, do, how do Linux distributions exist and stuff? What's the business model? A good question. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is free and open source, right? Yeah. You, you, it's just, uh, but there is still a business model somehow. We don't really have a business model. We are a non-profit and uh, we are all volunteers. But of course, we are uh, really happy to get some donations so we can keep our server infrastructure running. And <laughs> if we were to find uh, some really good uh, source of money, uh, we could actually hire a developer to do some of the work full time that would allow us to move even faster. But at the moment, we don't really have any income and we are still getting by just fine. So we don't really need a business model in the traditional sense. We do have one uh, sponsor. Uh, um, Open Mandriva was very, or Mandriva was very successful in Brazil. Um, Brazil had laws that um, forced open source software to be used there, and and uh, Open uh, and Mandriva bought a company called Connectiva, um, who were quite big in Brazil. And although that company is now gone, um, there are still people very interested in uh, Open Open Mandriva there, and we have one sponsor from there who sends us a small amount of money each year to uh, help us along and they use our, our, uh, our distribution commercially for government and, uh, and business use. 
So, so how it's, many, it's sound enough for that, you know. How many users are there? Do you know? <laughs> Good question. Um, well, last in the last three months, um, we have had 10,000 downloads from, of our ISO from SourceForge. So that will give you some idea. Um, there are a lot of people who still think Mandriver is quite a good distribution because it started out as being very user-friendly and it, it, it got a lot of people into Linux. I mean, the, what, the main reason I started using it was because it allowed me to access to Linux without too much pain. Obviously, over the years, I've learned how to uh, deal with it in other ways, but at the outset, you know, I would have been, uh, I had a lot more trouble if it hadn't been for something like um, Open Mandriver. It's or, easy to go on and, and install apps? It's much, much easier, yes, to, 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 to install an application. Um, there is a, a simple interface here. Is it called Play Store? Uh, no, it's not called Play Store. <laughs> is it called App Store? No, no it's not even called that. It's no. called RPM Drake at the moment, although this is about to change. So there's part of the the meeting here that we had. Um, just let me look this yeah, way. I'm not filming your password, don't worry. His <laughs> <laughs> password uh, is test one, two, three, four anyway. <laughs> um, so here, this is, this is our current interface, but we will be updating this to a, a, a much, much newer um, K, KDE interface very soon. It takes a little while to yeah. Depends on the, the RPMs, but... Sometimes the internet is really, really fast here in Budapest, but sometimes it's not, so it's yeah. a little mix. It's a little mix. Ooh, some guy here, right here, sorry. You're trying to uh, jump We're a bit slow here. Here we go. Oh, that was out of focus. You so here, here we, can, uh, it, it, we can pick applications. Um, you know, there's... So I might so how many apps? Oh, gosh. Everything, <laughs> Everything that's in... There is around 15,000 packages in the repositories right now. Yeah. And that's just, that's just the main repository. We have a contrib repository, which we're finding it hard to maintain, which has got about 16,000 or so in it. Mm. Um, most of them, well, a good number of them still work, so, but we, we could use some help with our, with our contrib repository. So if there's anybody out there who wants to learn how to use RPM and, uh, and, and get a few lessons in compiling and, and building software, then there's a big job there that... Uh, you know, we'd be more than happy to help somebody to. <laughs> so you have the Chromebook R13, right? This is a MediaTek, yes. quad-core MediaTek, big little. Uh, how many days before you have Open Mandriva running on it? That won't take much longer. As usual with uh, ARM hardware, there's a problem with the graphics chip. In this particular case, it's an Imagination Power VR, which doesn't have an open driver, but um, the guys at MediaTek are actually really cooperative and uh, will be sending me at least a binary driver, so nice. we can get that going quickly. They are, they are actually part of the NARA, right? So you have some contacts? Yes. So you just send an email, they respond within three hours, right? Sometimes, oh, yes. Sometimes. <laughs> All right, cool. So that's coming for sure. On the, and maybe also, could you maybe have it work on the Samsung Chromebook Plus, the one I have with the Rock Chip RK3399 OP1? <laughs> I can't guarantee it because right now I don't have the hardware, but in theory, I don't think there's anything overly complicated in it. I mean, it's a relatively generic ARC64 and it's a Mali GPU, which is problematic, but which also has a driver that should at least be available. So I don't see why it wouldn't work. Uh, Samsung is probably watching this video, so they can just ship you one directly to Switzerland, right? <laughs> that would be, nice. would be nice. So you can get the Chromebook Plus very soon. And uh, what, what else could be on the horizon? Uh, what do you have some dreams for, like, uh, uh, what well, could we're, happen? We're, we're, we're going to do, be doing some major revisions, and the big thing that's going to be happening is that we're, we're moving to a new version of RPM, and we're moving to the DNF package manager. This is probably one of the biggest changes that will go on with the distro in the next year. Um, this is a big thing. We've, for many, many years, we've used a program called URPMI, which is a Perl-based um, package manager. It's done good service. It's been really useful, but it's very, very difficult to maintain. Uh, it's very old code, and Perl and GTK don't go terribly well together. Um, so we're looking at using the DNF packaging manager. And probably what we will do is provide a wrapper script 
so that our users will not notice too huge a difference between the usage of a UR, PMI and DNF. Um, they'll still be able to type very similar commands to do the job. Um, in order to do this, there are some very big changes that have to go on in our infrastructure, our ABF, Automated Build Farm, um, which is an online build farm which um, helps us uh, create the distribution. And one of the big things is that we will have to change the structure of our repositories. So this is going to be quite a painful time for us. Um, probably we'll have about a month or so of really struggling a bit uh, until we get this sorted out. But once it's done, um, with a bit of luck, package, packaging will be much uh, more straightforward and the, the repositories will be much cleaner and uh, you know things will work a lot better. So that's, that's one of the biggest changes that we're, we're going to go through. The other, the other change is that we're going to try and implement a, a built-in um, QA tool into our, into our uh, ABF or our automated build farm. Currently, we use an external tool, um, but really it's not up, up to scratch. It takes our QA team a long time to test a very few packages. So we're hoping to improve that and so that we can be more responsive with updates. Um, the, the distribution will get new, uh, new software much more frequently because we'll be able to test more efficiently. So that's one of the biggest changes that's coming up. Um, and that will be in our 3.1 release which we think, best guess estimate is six to eight months is what we're looking at for our next release. Although we will be putting out um, sub-releases in between on the, current, on the current build, which is LX3. So there'll be an LX3.01, which is already out, and an LX3.02, and maybe even a 3.03 um, to the current, current release. So. Could you describe some of the some of the team that's working here? Because you said it was eight guys here yesterday. So where do you come from, and well, who are who who are they kind of? Well, I, I'm the president of Oak, current president. I'm not I've not been always the president, but I'm the current president. You're based of in London, Brand, right? And I'm based in London. My name's Colin Close. Um, this is Barrow, well, Bernard Rosengrantzer, who uh, who um, from the Alps, at, uh, yeah. who lives in the Alps, yeah, um, and uh, he, he's our he's our most skilled developer. Um, we have two other developers. Um, uh, one is uh, D T TPG or Tomek. Uh, he, he's from Poland. And we have an another developer who lives uh, not very far from me in London called Crispin Boylan. Um, and those are our three main developers. I, I do a small bit of low level development, but largely I, I, do, I help with the QA. And then we have Christina, which you've uh, already uh, you've already met, who is uh, in charge of our graphics, and she helps out with our forums. We have um, Raphael, who is, um, and, and, and JC, or Jean-Claude, they, they manage our, um, our website services and, uh, and all, the, um, all, the, all the nuts and bolts that are required to keep the front end of Mandreville, you know, our advertising, our websites, our forums, our mailing lists, so on, they, they, they keep those going. And then we have, um, we have two other developers in Russia, Fedya and his shadow, they're, they're good friends, uh, and they are, uh, they are largely responsible for maintaining and um, building um, new additions to our ABF build farm. And they also work on the ARM processors um, Fedra is very skilled in ARM um, processors, and that's an area where he works. And that, that's um, some, some of the team. Who have I forgotten, Bera? I'm sure I've forgotten somebody. <laughs> These guys. Well, of course, yeah, there is Swedo and Raska. <laughs> Swedo is, our, of course, our mascot. Com community um, uh, evangelist. This, this, the, he, he appears on... Some of some of our uh, logos, some of our logos and graphics, and uh, <laughs> although he's much bigger than when he was first uh, appeared on there, um, uh, is, are there enterprises or education? Who's using? Well, there, there's there's one other person I've forgotten. I knew there was somebody. Our secretary, of course, Kate Lebedev, um, who can't couldn't be here this time, unfortunately, but because uh, she's got a new job and she's really really busy. But um, Kate lives in Russia. Oh, sorry, lives in Germany now. She lives in Germany now, in Berlin, and uh, and she 
she acts as secretary and, uh, and is a great organiser and makes sure that we get things done, basically. She's very good for that. And uh, would you <laughs> like to encourage more people to join, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, ideally, I'd want the community that is slightly bigger than what we have right now, but it is not super large like the uh, Debbie and Orfedora's communities, because when you start getting that big, it uh, starts becoming less flexible. It becomes but, like corporate or what? What but the thing is, it uh, gets harder to uh, get decisions done right now. It's easy for us to get even unanimous decisions to switch to some new technology, even if people don't have as much experience with it as they used to have the older technologies. If you have hundreds or thousands of people working on it, it's hard to find the consensus. And then people but are kind of like fighting for different roles and stuff? That could the, also happen. Oh, I want to be the maintainer. No, yeah, then they fight to the death or something. How does it work? <laughs> How does it work? Fortunately, so far we haven't uh, seen too much of that, but that was actually to some extent go, uh, going on uh, while Mandriva, the company, was in charge. We certainly won't tolerate that sort of behavior in our new community. How does it work to choose who's the maintainer? Is just the, the, the guy that has the most skills, that has submitted most patches, and he's the maintainer automatically? How does it work? Yeah, right now we also don't have super strict roles. Uh, like, I know I have some packages that I need to look after, but if someone else uh, has something to contribute to those packages, I certainly won't eat them if they just uh, go ahead and commit something. In the worst case, uh, we have to revert a commit that was broken, but... Uh, you won't eat them, for sure. <laughs> okay. well, I you, may feed them to the dogs, but... Because <laughs> you're vegetarian, but your, right. dogs, your dogs, they eat anything, right? Hey, these guys, they eat anything. <laughs> well, we use GitHub for, for, our, uh, for our RPM spec repositories, so reversion is quite straightforward, and we can obviously work with pull requests, um, which makes it quite easy because the maintainer can review the commit before it's actually committed so you know it's it's quite easy to avoid conflict uh, you know so we, we don't we don't have a large area problem we do try and be a very friendly community i mean that's the thing we don't we don't to tolerate um bullies like it? linus torvald you know sort <laughs> of uh, uh, uh bad bad behavior shall we say i mean we, we set out not to have this um this rather adversarial aspect that was sometimes found in, in Linux distributions. Do you, do you uh, filter out or uh, do you uh, what's called censor bad world words in the discussion? Mm, no. Try no, not to. We just don't use them. Just joking. <laughs> There's no automatic uh, no, no, kick ban. No. 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 no okay. we, I mean, we try and be polite and civil and uh, and, and fun as well. Obviously, I mean, uh, I think it, it can working on the distribution. It can become very dry and and. That, that's what we try and avoid. We try and always have a little bit of fun as well as do some serious work. And, and it seems to work, doesn't it, Bera? Yeah, sure. I think we, we're all good friends and enjoy a, a company. You know, if we're on IRC, we quite often chat about other things apart from what we're actually doing. So. Like Trump, maybe. Well, no, no, we don't. No, 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 no. It's just not uh, a. Uh, so you're the friendly, uh, the friendly uh, distribution. You oh, are very, the yeah, latest no. tech, the, the best. The, the, and, and now there's a whole opportunity right here with the ARM laptops that are coming out, the ARM Chromebooks with developer mode, what do you call it? Yeah, of what course, and I'm it, also uh, working on an ARM desktop box that should be ready pretty soon. Currently waiting for a mainboard to be delivered that uh, is getting a little bit delayed by its manufacturer, but afterwards we should also have a pretty nice desktop uh, based on ARC64. And uh, uh, so the guys that want to, and girls that want to use an ARM laptop, ARM desktop, uh, that might think that Chrome OS is not a real OS, like you say, kind of, <laughs> they would like to crouton, what's it called, to get uh, different Linux. And so there's an opportunity right there for Open Mandriva to be the one people would choose because you have the latest tech, right? Right. So it's potentially going to be a big deal. Possibly. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're doing it. <laughs> it's been... They're jolly hard work. I mean, we've got, we've now at a, at a point with this where we know roughly how much it's going to cost to produce a prototype. Um, we have approached, num I've approached a number of companies uh, and they have given me a price for creating what we need. And how much? Um, the, Is that a secret? Well, it's less than a hundred thousand pounds. 
Okay, All that right. sounds good. <laughs> that sounds good. And then you can afford. We can afford it, right? Yeah, so it's, it's painful, but I work at Linaro, so I'm not exactly poor. So I'm going to put some of my personal resources into this, so we will get it done. And uh, <laughs> then uh, people will be able to buy it somewhere. There will be soon some news about this. We hope yeah, so. Yeah, unless things go wrong. <laughs> we're, we're still working away at it. It's going to happen. Um, we, the current estimate for timing for a first prototype is about eight months. Um, that's what I've come up with so far. It may be possible to shorten that if we can deal with the display issues. One, one of the problems, of course, is, as Barrow explained, is we don't have all open source drivers currently for the, the, the SOM that we wish to use. But that's almost solved now, so we're hoping that that will help in the timing aspect of things. But currently we're having to um, look at a design that covers a lot of different bases just in case this won't work, then we can use something else. And that's not really the best way of going about things. So hopefully that, that issue is now resolved. So it's going to be hard to get it uh, ready for all the engineers in the next Linear Connect? That would be nice. It would be nice. Because <laughs> that would be a pretty cool uh, group of four, five hundred uh, test users, right? Right. right. <laughs> and that would certainly be users interested in it, but... Yeah. Uh, it's basically a laptop you put in in 96 boards. That could also be that, right? That would be another interesting variant that might also happen pretty soon. Mm. There's, a, there's quite an issue with 96 boards, though, because um, many of the earlier ones don't have any interface for um, SSD drives or anything like that. They're all, they all operate off some relatively slow um, memory devices, so they're not really suitable. Maybe the um, enterprise for board. Well, there are yeah. some yeah, now coming and out. There's also two consumer edition boards coming out soon that will be fast enough, but I can't reveal any details on those. You know lots of secrets because you have access to everything, the whole world. You, 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 you have like an overview of what's going on, right? Well, I know what's happening inside Linaro, but I don't know what's happening in the rest of the world. Okay, okay cool. Okay, cool. He doesn't get time. <laughs> cool. All right. But uh, thanks a lot for, for showing this off. Uh, world exclusive uh, first view on the ARM 64 powered laptop, uh, soon to be running Open Mandriva. Here at the Open Mandriva uh, Summit in Budapest. When is the next uh, meeting going to happen? The next meeting will be next year sometime, around the same time. We haven't decided on the venue yet, but um, I dare say it'll be in Eastern Europe because it's uh, convenient and not too expensive, so that makes it life easier um, for all of us. A, um, there seems to be a huge train station just outside. That's here, right, right, that's the Western train station. And there's another one just the same. Of, a, a few miles away, which is the eastern one. <laughs> You're going to take the train in a few hours? Yes, I'm leaving here at 8.40. Taking the train was certainly the most convenient way to get the dogs here. So these guys, they don't want to go in a, in a what's it called, a luggage compartment. <laughs> right, and yeah. I don't want to torture them, so... <laughs> but this guy, you could, you could carry him up as hand luggage, right? Probably. You want to be posing, but I don't really want to separate them. He wants to be an EasyJet, I think. He's posing, isn't he? Look at him. Because this cheap, very cheap whiz air, EasyJet to uh, direct to Geneva, that's very near your home, right? Yeah, that's about a two hour drive from home. And there's also other airports like Basel or... Yeah, Zurich. Basel and Zurich and Milano are all within driving range from me. Do you have, a, uh, do you have some, uh, some people come to your home to, to work on some projects? Well, you haven't hosted any summits there yet. Not yet, but it would certainly be possible. Yeah, you should do a, a, a two-week, uh, what's called, festival. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll go for that. Yeah. <laughs> two weeks in the Alps, yep. Yeah, this summer you can uh, compete with a paleo festival in Switzerland or some other, <laughs> and do a, like, there could be a, a whole bunch of campers outside your home. Is, is there like a big space, right? It's up on the top of the mountain, basically. No, yeah, not exactly on the top, but uh, quite a bit above the village, so I'm at 1,300 meters altitude. <laughs> Can you make sure there's going to be a gigabit Ethernet uh, connection, fiber? <laughs> not quite yet, but we have pretty good DSL connectivity, and fiber will probably come Swisscom not too is, far away. Swisscom is pretty amazing. They want to give a gigabit to every Swiss by the end of next year or something. Yes. Yeah. It's coming. 
So for sure, your festival is going to be pretty fast connection, <laughs> and people can just bring their own tents, right? Yeah, yeah. And stay uh, <laughs> with the and uh, the, all the mountain dogs that yeah. save people. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank okay. you, Nicholas. Thank you.